and here and okay and here in person people in the back can you hear me all right okay thank you uh, okay so welcome to to this several research seminar uh, today I'm, I'm happy to introduce uh, Anna Sorensen uh, who could join us uh, here today in Barcelona uh, Anna is a physicist uh, and researcher of the Argentinian Research Council she studies the hydrological cycle and its connection to land cover changes of the La Plata Basin and the agricultural deeper plains of the Argentinian Pampas in collaboration with hydrologists, agronomists, and anthropologists. Uh, she's also a member of the WCRP GUX hydrocolometology panel. And within this framework of the WCRP uh, lighthouse activity, my climate risk, she leads the interdisciplinary Argentinian hub uh, with the objective to create climate risk information for decision making using a, a bottom up uh, approach. Um, and Anna was also a coordinating lead author of the chapter linking global to regional climate change of the IPCC AR6 work group one report, mm -hmm. uh, which is the, the physical science basis. And still in the framework of the IPCC, she's a member of the core writing team of the of the synthesis report of the IPCC AR6, uh, which is hot of the press. Uh, from the latest panel session held in Interlaken. And this is of a special interest for us um, today, as Anna will present the key findings of the AR6 synthesized in, in this report. So thanks again for being here, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Pep, for the introduction. Can you hear me at the back? Okay, great. Uh, so I think I will stand to, to see all of you. Thank you so much for coming. It's uh, Really nice to be able to fill this uh, this big room, and thanks for joining online. Thanks for the invitation to to give the this talk. Um, so I will present the, some of the uh, relevant stuff from the synthesis report. As Pep said, is it was approved exactly one month ago, so it is uh, quite uh, uh, out of the press, and um, yeah. Um, so, you know, the IPCC, it's like the scientific body that uh, informs uh, the, the global decision makers about what decision they should take about around climate change. So, as we say with Paco, it's actually a Paco, his, his uh, idea, but I, I always agree and say it myself, it is like a huge climate service. So the, the decision maker has uh, asked the scientists to do certain assessments and uh, we do them happily. So this works in cycles. So we are now doing, we completed the sixth assessment cycle where we had three special reports, which was global warming of 1.5 that came out in 2018. In 2019, we had climate change and land and uh, ocean and cryosphere as two special reports. And then we had the common uh, working group reports. So we have the physical science basis, we have impacts, adaptation and vulnerability, and we have mitigation. So uh, in my case, uh, I was uh, involved in the working group one report. As, um, as Pep said, I was uh, leading a, a chap uh, one of the chapters together with Paco actually. So that is why I know Paco. And uh, this was a fantastic experience. And then I was also um, able to be one of the authors of the synthesis report. It was also really great uh, because uh, in the synthesis report, you, you work together with uh, scientists from all the fields uh, because you have economists, you have biologists, you have from the older working groups, all the disciplines that together is needed to tackle the problems of climate change. So both things was really great, uh, the chapter work as well as the synthesis report work. So I, um, if you have any questions on that part of, 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 of of, of me, like to ask about IPCC and uh, if you want to become an author, just uh, go ahead in the question session. So this is the outline of the presentation today. Uh, the warning, the challenge and the hope. So the warning of the 
report is that the pace and scale of climate actions are in, insufficient to tackle climate change. So um, uh, greenhouse gases are continuing to increase. Actually, in the last decade, the pace of uh, the increment has slowed down, but uh, we have, to have still too little action to stop the climate change. Uh, we have, this is causes uh, augmented or, or concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And for example, we have uh, um, for, the, the highest con concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for at least two years. And this result in the um, change in temperature. So here you have um, uh, the temperature from 1850 to 2020. And uh, uh, e actually each uh, one of the last four decades have been the warmest decade in the history. So now the last decade was uh, 1.5 uh, degrees warmer than um, the reference period, which is 1850 to 1900. Um, most vulnerable countries emit, emit less per capita. So this is a graph that uh, we had a little resistance on this graph in the synthesis report. It's not in the SPM, so that's I think it wouldn't have flowed in the in the in the SPM, but it is in the long report. So here you see the emissions of uh, 1919. We couldn't do it historically, uh, like the historical emissions, but actually it is quite similar. Uh, this uh, this uh, exponential curve. Uh, also, it's very important to recall that. Um, Vulnerability, which we have on this axis, right? Vulnerability here and 2019 emissions here. So um, even if um, um, if this is by country, within countries, we have large differences in vulnerabilities and within regions. I think I go with, with the pointer, if I can, if I can get the point out to this side. So, I, okay. Let's, okay, so also uh, human activities have caused all the global warmings in 1850. So you can see here that uh, the observed warming of the last decade matches uh, exactly with the attributed uh, warming that we can attribute to human influence. So actually, if it wasn't for the aerosols that cold the global atmosphere with uh, 0 0.4 degrees, we would already be at 1.5 degrees. So we have sort of a uh, an evil masking of, of uh, the global warming. Also, uh, the human activity have caused many changes in the physical climate system. Something that is new in this report, if you compare to AR5, is that nowadays we can really attribute extreme events and single extreme events to uh, human um, human caused climate change. Um, you, here we have some examples. For example, it's virtually virtually certain that the increase in hot extremes are caused by by human action and the acidification of the upper ocean. We have the sea level rise, the glacier retreat, increase in her, her precipitation and even out fire and compound flooding. Also, uh, it is possible to attribute the impacts of climate change to directly to um, uh, to, to climate change. So if you had an impact, it would be not only the drought, but the, the, the reduced food, food production. You can, you can attribute that. So here we have different systems of the world that we can see that we have water availabil availability and food production, heat, health and well-being, city settlements and infrastructure are all negatively affected globally. So these are the global assessments that we were able to do in the synthesis report. So you see, for example, in, in health, it's quite interesting to see that we now have a set assessment on mental health, displacement, of course, malnutrition and heat and infectious disease, diseases. And um, um, 
to move forward. Uh, if you have seen something and only one picture from the synthesis report, it might have been this one, because this one was uh, uh, the one that was picked up most by media. And it's also the, also one of the first uh, figures in the report, in the, the as a summary for policymakers. So here, uh, the idea is to uh, communicate that the extent to which current and future generations will experience a hotter and different world depends on child choices now and in the near term. And it's also the idea to uh, communicate the injustice in uh, between generations. So if you were born in 1950, you have lived a life uh, with much less uh, climate disasters than if you are born in 2020. But it also meant to show that it depends on our decision now. So here we have the different scenarios. In working group one, we used five scenarios from very low emissions, which uh, for some of you might be known as the 1.9 scenario, to the very high emissions, uh, 8.5. Uh, so if we look at the very low scenario, uh, you can see that uh, it is basically constant around 1.5 degrees during the whole uh, century. So even if we follow the low scenario, a person that is born in 2020 will experience a hotter world than we experience now. So we don't have any scenarios that goes under 1.5 really. And the very high and high scenarios, they end up be, uh, around four degrees of global warming. And uh, this, um, we work a lot on global warming levels in this report. I think that is quite new compared to the AR5. So here in this figure, we uh, uh, put uh, uh, some uh, uh, hazards that can induce impacts in heat waves and droughts and floodings. So at the first, here we have the, uh, um, the different wo global warming levels. And then we have different uh, variables. We can look at more closer to them. We have the annual hottest te day temperature change. So here, if we, for example, what we can see here is that it changes more of a land. The pattern is the same, but it intensifies. Uh, so it scales really well with global uh, temperature. We see that uh, for a temperature of four degree globally, the hottest temperature in the Amazons and also in, in, the, in the Mediterranean region would be about uh, seven degrees hotter. So like this is what we always say, like the extremes change more than the, the, the mean values. Also for the, um, the water variables here, we have soil moisture that um, indicates in the brown regions that droughts and aridification will be severer. Uh, so you can see that, uh, uh, for example, your region, you already know this, uh, and also uh, the Amazon region. And the well, for me, it's important, the Amazon region. I think for the whole world, the Amazon is important. But you can see here that uh, some regions get really drier. Uh, but when we look at the annual wettest day precipitation change, actually it is a positive over all land regions. So even if you will have an aridification, for example, due to a extended drought period, then uh, during the rainy period, you will have a larger rainfall. And this is a problem, of course. So these are three examples of variables that scale with global temperature. So we have this idea, uh, the technical idea or the um, technocrat idea that we can uh, rise the temperature of the earth and then we can remove carbon from the atmosphere. So if we would do that, well, even if ecosystems and stuff like that get destroyed at some degree and then, but then if we return, uh, the picture should look almost like this, right? In these type of variables, but uh, not so for others such as the sea level rise. So I would um, wanted to show some of the figures from the report on sea level rise. So um, these uh, extreme civil events are compound events. So it, due to both the regional sea level rise and uh, to uh, precipitation and storms, so uh, here we have um, uh, we have data where we 
have data, where we have a gauge stage station that can measure. So that is why we don't have data on the full coast. So we are comparing uh, frequency of events that currently occur on average once every one, 100 years. So currently, not in the pre-industrial, currently. So if you have the this color, this really dark color, that a 100 year event will be an annual event. And uh, uh, the next one is a decadal event. So you can see that many readers will actually see in 2014, which is really soon, uh, that a 100 year event is an annual event. And here it's really uh, only time when it's uh, difficult to have a lot of data. As you see, you see really well in data sparse research what, what is happening. Around here, you would need to really look at the data to know what's happening. But in the Mediterranean, you do have a lot of data. Um, so this was sea level rise, extreme, extreme events for 2040. Here, we know that sea level rise will continue for millennia. But how fast and how much depends on future emissions. So we shouldn't just say, OK, sea level rise is lost. Uh, really, when we look at longer time periods, uh, it is a lot of change from the different scenarios. So um, we can start looking at this uh, bo bottom panel where we have the observed curve. It starts in 1900, it goes to 2100. We have observed sea level rise, mean sea level rise. And now it's about uh, um, 0, 0 0.27 meters. Um, and you can see that up to 2050, there is not so many differences in scenarios. So whatever scenario we, we follow, we will have uh, 1 billion of people exposed uh, to sea level rise in 2050. And this will uh, in inevitably lead to losses of coastal ecosystems and ecosystem services, groundwater salinization, flooding and damages to coastal infrastructure. And this is very important. The sea level uh, uh, that on the, la on the um, other figure and this one is very important for adaptation action because here we can't really, we, it's no way we can do, we must adapt and uh, or um, we have to respond some, somehow to this. Uh, but we can see that for longer time periods, this, this uh, um, abanico, it opens, so we can see that we have um, larger differences uh, between scenarios in 2150 and uh, at the year 2300. Uh, there were model results available for the low scenario, which is a 2.6, and the very high scenario, the 8.5. So here it was possible to assess the range, which is around two meters for the low scenario and around five meters in the, in the mean value for the high scenario. Here we have a lot of uncertainty because um, we don't know and this might be a gap that can potentially be closed next, you know, for the next cycle in the IPCC world. But um, uh, there is a lack of knowledge uh, on the, the ice shelf, uh, sh uh, shelves. So if we, we know that the Greenland and the West Antarctica ice shelf are the most um, that are most in, in danger, you know, so if uh, um, if they melt, which we don't know, it can raise uh, up to 15 meters, the sea level, because uh, each of them contribute with about uh, uh, six to seven meters. All right, uh, so the challenge then is to cut emissions quickly, sharply, to create a safer, sustainable world, scale up practices and infrastructure to enhance uh, resilience. So this is uh, very difficult, you know, because um, we have uh, uh, quite little of the carbon but it left to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. So if we start at the bottom figure here, this figure was already in AR5. It shows the linear relationship between the uh, accumulated C, uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere on the x-axis here cumulative CO2 emissions. And here we have 
the warming. Um, so this starts off in 1850. So we have the historical global warming plotted here together with the, with the cumulative CO2 emissions. We see that even, well, in the, his, the, his, the record, it is lineal and in the scenarios, it is lineal. Here we see that the different scenarios, I don't see if you can read the numbers, but it's 1.5, 2.6, 4.5, 7.2, 8.5. .5. So we see that uh, the 1.5, for example, stops here because it, it goes only up to about the 1.6 this century. The 2.6 stops here because it only gets up to two this in the century. And the other scenarios, they stop because time stops. <laughs> it, it is only, the graph is only plotted up to 2100, right? Um, so uh, given this, we can see really clearly here with this uh, nice uh, uh, design of the figure that to reach point 1.5, we have this carbon budget here, which is this green. We can compare the carbon that we already have emitted. So we see this is quite little. Um, to get up to two degrees with a 83% chance we have this green bar and with, with a 67% chance we have a little bit more of carbon budget. So this is depends on the climate sensitivity. Although, uh, the working group one report and the science did narrow down the, uh, the range of climate sensitivity. Mm -hmm. We do have a range. So this impacts on the estimation of the, of the carbon budget. Okay, so make this a little bit more practical. What, how, much is, how much is it? So if we assume emissions that are constant at 2019 level, the carbon budget for 1.5 would be exhausted in 2030. Another way to look at it is to look at all uh, fossil um, infrastructure and take the lifetime that uh, from that infrastructure, it leads to more than 1.5 is this graph here. And we also unfortunately have planned infrastructure. Uh, so if we calculate also the planned in infrastructure, we get almost up to two degrees in the best estimate. Okay, so now, um, so to limit to 1.5 or two degrees, you understand that we have to do deep, rapid, and in most cases, immediate greenhouse gas emission reductions. This graph shows this in the, another perspective, having the emissions here on this side and the time here. Uh, so here we have the historical emissions up to 2015, where the CMIP-6 uh, runs started. And um, we see here that uh, when we create scenarios, uh, sometimes we do scenarios that are goal-oriented. So the 1.5 or two degree uh, scenarios from the working group three that uses these integrated assessment models to produce the scenarios, they are goal oriented. They want to, okay, let's see how can I reach two or uh, 1.5 degrees. So then it, you can see that to be able to do that, we have to limit in this, in this pace. Um, so half to, to reduce to half about if we want to, to 2013, if we want 30, sorry, if we want to limit to 1.5. So, and here in this range, we have an estimation of what the nationally determined contribution would lead to in 2030. So you see that um, this, if we were on, on track, it would be here down, down here, right? So this is the, the, what the countries have promised for 2030. And uh, the problem is that this is the promise gap, so to say, but this is the implemented gap. So you see that implemented policies are not going in the direction of the promises even. Okay. So this is very severe. And of course, when we get this curve, uh, this scenario of implemented policies have a huge uncertainties because we don't know what will happen, uh, what technologies or, or what socioeconomic uh, state of the world we will have. Uh, okay, something I missed to say here is that this graph is uh, has a net zero here. 
and it's a net zero of all greenhouse gases, okay? So not only uh, carbon dioxide. So this is uh, a graph that you might have seen when you have the CO2 emissions and we're talking about reaching net zero when, 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 when countries or companies are talking about reaching net zero, they're talking often about this. Sometimes it's not really clear what they are talking about, but the relevant, uh, most relevant is to talk about the net uh, carbon dioxide emissions, because as soon as we get uh, to negative emissions, the temperature would begin to decline. Would that be possible? So we see that the most of the, the scenario that keeps us to 1.5 reach net zero emissions in 2050, and the one that have um, net zero emissions uh, in 2070 will lead us to two degrees. And here is not to go into detail here, but just to let you know that working group three has created um, different scenarios on how to do this. So in which sector is it possible to reduce? In which sector is it possible? So this is like uh, some different options uh, for which sector contribute to net net negative emissions at the end. At the end uh, net zero at the time of net zero for example no scenario do um, um, and assume that we will get to zero methane emissions this is sort of as impossible not feasible so what is the hope seeing this uh, uh, full panorama uh, so what the reports say is that uh, we can mainstream effective and equitable climate action now, and this will re reduce losses and damages to people and nature. Climate action also provides co-benefits. Multiple feasible and e effective options are available to reduce greenhouse gases and to adapt to human-caused climate change. Okay, so these uh, multiple feasible effective effective options to give you an example, a very practical example of this. I wanted to show this graph that's on renewable electricity generation. So this is increasingly price competitive in some, and, and some sectors are uh, adapting it. So you can see here the, how much the, the, the solar uh, price, the electricity from, from photovoltaic is from onshore and offshore wind. So the blue ones are the renewable energy and this yellow is the fuel fossil fuel cost in 2020. So you see that it is getting competitive and the market adoption has been exponential. Uh, this is the electric vehicles that uh, has uh, also been exponential in, in the use. This is the cost of the, the, the battery. Uh, here, this graph is really uh, nice. Uh, it's a really uh, cool graph. It is uh, the last one in the synthesis report. It shows that there are multiple opportunities for scaling up climate action. This side of the graph is um, climate responses and adaptation options. So um, this column here is potentially feasibility up to, to for adaptation and response up to 1.5 degrees. So here you can see the color, darker color means that it is high feasibility to adapt. Uh, more points means that it is a higher conf confidence level. Uh, it's just an IPCC way of showing cer certainty. Uh, and, and this uh, column here shows the synergy with mitigation. So we see that we have a lot of synergy in the different sectors with mitigation. Uh, this part of the graph shows the mitigation options. So uh, the, this is, uh, the, the scale here is um, gigatons of, of um, carbon dioxide equivalents per year. Uh, until 2030, and it goes up to five, this scale. Um, if it is blue, it means that it is uh, cheaper than fossil fuels. And if it's yellow and up to red, it is more and more uh, expensive. So um, 
Uh, yes, I wanted to compare this to the very first figure I showed for you, which is the emission increases over historical time, where you can see that in 2019, we emitted around 57 uh, CO2 equivalent. And um, uh, if we sum up all this, uh, it actually goes to over 40. So the potential is there, right? Um, and if you would do everything, it will be it would be possible. Uh, so what are these? I will just mark some of these bars quickly. So you can see a renewable energy. We all, the, the top two mm -hmm. one here are solar and wind. These are the most uh, the cheapest. We have a geothermal and hydropower. Is this one? I'm not counting perhaps nuclear as uh, renewable, but this is nuclear. Then one that is very interesting and very important, I think, for policymakers to see is that these are bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, and, and this, this is this one, and this is carbon capture and storage. So uh, actually all the scenarios uh, that uh, lead to uh, two degrees or 1.5 degrees, they do have negative emissions, but here, you can really see that this is not feasible uh, for big reductions in the near term. So this is technology that uh, sometimes um, governments and companies rely on a lot when they make their promises. But today we they are not um, uh, so they are very expensive and they don't give so much reduction actually. Here, this is the nice. Um, a part of it. This is where individual action can contribute. This is, I do that. Everyone who gives talk about climate change will have the question, what can I do? So on. So here we have a shift to sustainable diets. It's quite big. It doesn't have any cost because it, it, you can't assess it on a global scale, how much it will cost or how little it will cost. Reduce food loss and waste. And here we have fuel efficient vehicles, electric vehicles. These are options that are possible in, in rich countries, which is a quite small part of the world if you think about it globally, but perhaps here in Spain, I think you, you can make it probably. Uh, we can have effective lightning, uh, public transport and bicycling is this one. Um, and here we have the avoid of demand for energy services. And so you can see uh, not assessed so much avoid of demand. So that's not a big uh, a big thing that that uh, they think will be feasible. And lastly, uh, this is a really nice uh, <laughs> if conclusion from working group one and three uh, that strong rapid and sustained reduction in methane emissions can limit near term warming and improve air quality by re reducing global surface ozone. And this arrow points as, at the health se sector. So the economic benefits for human health from air quality improvement arising from mitigation action can be of the same order of magnitude as mitigation costs and potentially even larger. So this is a really nice uh, um, and, and like brings hope to, to, the, to the issue, right? Okay, so to, to round off this presentation and leave uh, room for question, I have some finalizing slides. Fairness is part of the solution. And uh, remember that uh, those who contributed the least to climate change are often the most vulnerable to its consequences and impacts. People in, for example, people in highly vulnerable areas are up to 50 times more likely to die in floods, droughts, and storm compared to the rest of the world. These are, this is what happened actually in the last decade. Increased financing for climate actions. To meet uh, 1.5, we would need uh, six times the current climate investment. Uh, this investment is there. There is enough uh, global financing to, to meet this request, uh, but we need to direct it to, to climate action. Developing countries require external funding to meet adaptation and, and mitigation needs. And the way forward is the climate resilient development, which is when we integrate measure 
to adapt to climate change with actions to reduce emission in ways that provide wider benefits to meet the sustainable development goals, like improving health and livelihoods, reducing poverty and hunger, and clean energy, water and air. So some enables for effective climate action is political commitment, inclusive governance, international cooperation, effective ecosystem stewardship, and sharing of diverse knowledge. So this is the final message and you can find the report at the website. So thank you. Okay, so now we will open uh, some time for questions and discussion. Uh, so please, if someone in, in the room or or online have any questions, we, we can hear them. Okay. Uh, thanks, Anna, for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, linking to the last uh, plot you showed, where there's, there has been any discussion on the potential uh, inclusion of this hot topic these days, uh, geoengineering strategies or within the, the group, I would say, just a 